This movie poster is a personal exercise that I created using Blender, free Sketchfab models, and the free MB Lab add-on. It is inspired by the Expandables posters designed by Ignition and LA. I'm sure you can tell that the weapons are the 3D models downloaded from Sketchfab. But did you notice that the bulletproof vest is also 3D? In this video, I will give a breakdown of my creation process for this composite. Let's start by discussing the photoshoot setup. I shot our subject in a studio using these different lights. This one is our key light, coming from the top right. For the rim light, I used this backlight, coming from the top left. This light here was used to get catch lights in the eyes, and since it had a minimal effect on the overall lighting, I chose to ignore it when recreating the scene. And finally, it was shot on the Sony A7R4 with a 90mm lens. This is our scene in Blender. We got the camera, the key light, and the backlight. Let's start with the camera. I set the focal length to 90 mm to match the lens used on the shoot. For the sensor, I switched from auto to horizontal and looked up online what the dimension of the Sony A7R4 sensors are and input them in those fields. We can save this as a preset by clicking on the three dots and entering a new preset name. Once we click on the plus button, the preset is saved for future use. In the output settings, I set the resolution to match the resolution of the RAW file, which is quite a lot, so we can always render smaller for our test renders. In the camera object data properties, I imported a background image, which is a JPEG version of the RAW file. We can set this reference image to be in front of our objects or behind them. And we can change the opacity. This will be useful to match the 3D mannequin with our reference model. A fast way to turn it on and off from the 3D viewport is to click the Show Overlays button. Now for the 3D mannequin, I will use the MB Lab add-on. I will select a character from the drop-down and choose Caucasian male as this fits our model. Now I will click on the Create Character button and give the add-on some time to generate our model. I will start by matching the overall proportions of our 3D mannequin to our reference model. So I will increase the mass and increase the tone to add some muscle. When clicking on the body measures and selecting the body from the drop-down, we can change the overall size of our 3D mannequin. Those basic parameters gives us a good starting point to match the 3D mannequin with our reference model. Now to match the pose, I will split the interface into three panels. I will click and drag to open a new panel and click and drag once more. This top panel, I will switch to the top view by pressing 7 on the numpad. This button panel, I will keep it as the 3D view. And for this panel, I will switch to camera view by pressing 0 on the numpad to take advantage of our reference image. To pose the mannequin, I will select the rig and switch from object mode to pose mode. The bone between his feet controls the entire rig. I want to move the mannequin, but have him stay on the ground. To do this, I press G to move, and then Shift Z to disable the Z axis. Now by using the same bone, I will rotate the mannequin by pressing R to rotate and Z to rotate along the Z axis. This bone in the front controls the head position. So let's bring it down a bit. 
To move the arms, I will select the bone coming out of the wrist and take advantage of the top view. Press G to move and place it in front. Now from the camera view, move it up. As you can see, the elbow is now in an odd position. Those two bones at the back of the mannequin are used to control the elbow position. So let's select them and press G to move. Now let's do the same for the other arm. Select the bone that comes out from the wrist. From the top view, place it in front. And from the camera view, move it up. Now finally, select the bone in the back to move the elbow. Now we can see that the proportions of our 3D mannequin do not match those of our real life model, which is to be expected. For example, the 3D mannequin has a longer neck and it has shorter arms. The very nice thing about the MBLAB add-on is that we can change these proportions on the fly. So let's give ourselves some space and bring back the add-on by pressing the N key. Now we'll click on measurements and from the drop-down, I will select the neck for example. And I will make it shorter by reducing the length. Now for the arms, let's select them from the drop-down and increase the length by increasing the upper arm length. With this back and forth process of selecting the armature, switching to pose mode and placing the arms, as well as adjusting the proportions in the MBLAB add-on, I was able to match our mannequin with our real life model pretty closely. As a final step, once I got it as close as I could by using the rigged mannequin and the MBLAB add-on, I selected the mesh and switched to sculpt mode. I then used the grab brush and clicked and pulled on the mesh to have it match as close as I could. As you can see, the end result is far from perfect, but for what we will be using it for, it will be extremely useful. We will use it as a reference point for other objects in the scene. We will use it to cast shadows, to bounce in direct light, as a holdout object and as a shadow catcher. More on that later. Now let's discuss the lighting. Notice that the area light for our key light is much bigger than the area light for our backlight. When looking at the lighting diagram, we can see that for the backlight, I used the bare flash and for the key light, I bounced the flash in an umbrella. This means that the backlight is a small light source and the key light is a big light source. This is important because the quality of the light is defined by the size of the light source relative to the subject. So for example, here we have a small light source which gives us a hard light with defined shadows. When I increase the size of the light source, we get a soft light with soft shadows. So when matching the lighting, we must also match the size of our light sources. Note that a recent feature is that we can now control the spread of area lights. And finally, I want to draw your attention to the fact that even without any lights in our scene, the objects still get illuminated. The lighting comes from the environment, which by default emits a small amount of light. So depending on the lighting you want to achieve, you might have to disable it or change it to an HDRI. Now let's add the bulletproof vest into our scene. I will open the side panel with the N key and switch to the Sketchfab add-on and search for Vest. This gives us a lot of results and the one I used is the Combat Vest by C.S. Heffield. I will click Import Model to download it. Pay attention to the license when downloading Sketchfab models. Now let's move it into position. 
and of course it does not fit our mannequin perfectly, so I use the same technique as before, that is, switching to the sculpt mode and picking the grab brush to adapt the vest to our mannequin. Thanks to CS Heffield, we have a high quality model with high quality textures. But when looking at the Velcro patches, we can see that the photogrammetry process did not capture this high frequency detail. I felt like this was a giveaway that the model was 3D. So I chose to recreate the Velcro in Blender using a hair particle system. Okay, so let's select our vest, switch to the particles tab, add the particle system and set it to hair. The hairs are way too long, so let's make them shorter. The hairs are distributed on the entire model, so to define the Velcro patches, we will be using the weight paint mode. First, let's go to the viewport shading options and switch from material to texture to get a clear guide where we need to paint. I will paint this Velcro patch here. So now with the object selected, let's go from object mode and switch to weight paint. The default weight paint colors are very dark, which makes it hard to see where we need to paint. So let's use custom colors instead. To do this, let's go to edit, preferences, and under the editing tab, scroll down to the weight paint section. Now let's enable custom colors. For the weight of zero, I will use blue, just like in the default, but instead a brighter one, which makes it easier to see the texture. And for the weight of one, I will use red. Now I can paint with the brush and use the shortcut F to change the brush size. Once I'm done with the painting, I can disable used custom colors to clean up the weight map. When we paint a weight map, Blender creates a vertex group. We can find it under the object data properties. By default, it is called group. So let's double click and rename it Velcro patch. Now to have this group affect the distribution of the particles, let's switch back to the particles tab and scroll down to the vertex groups section. And now let's input it under the density field. And now all of the particles are being emitted based on our weight paint. To get the Velcro look, I added some interpolated children. Now let's make the hair even shorter. I press and hold the shift key to be able to make small adjustments. Under the roughness section, I increased the random value. Let's preview the result. The hairs are too thick. Under the hair shape section, I will reduce the diameter root. And finally, let's increase the amount of particles. Alright, so I downloaded all of these weapons and to have a reference for the wing shape, I downloaded this wing model as well. Now it is time to place the weapons over the wings. Here are some tips when working with a lot of objects. Since I will be using this object as a reference only, I do not want to be able to select it. So let's disable selection in the outliner. In the shading options, let's switch to random. This separates the object visually and makes it easier to see if they are intersecting. The objects are spread out into the scene. If I want to place them onto one line, I can select them all and in the options, choose affect only locations. This allows me to use the scale tool and scale the objects close to each other without deforming the meshes. So to scale them on one line, I will press S to scale, X to constrain to the X axis and zero. And finally, instead of placing our objects, by selecting them, pressing G to move, and then left click to confirm, let's open the toolbar 
and switch to the Tweak tool. This allows us to move objects simply by clicking and dragging with the mouse. Once the wing is done, I will shift right click to place the 3D cursor and add an empty by pressing Shift A, Empty. I will choose a sphere and scale it down. Now let's parent all of the weapons to this empty. So let's select the weapons, shift click on the empty and press Ctrl P, set parent to object. We are now controlling the weapons with this empty, which will be useful to place our wing. A fast way of placing the wing behind our model is to first select the empty, then shift click on the vest, and using the shortcut Shift S, Selection to Active. We can now place our wing. Alright, so now we got all of the different elements combined together, and it is time to take advantage of the 3D mannequin to help in the compositing process. So let's have a look at the different render passes we will be using. Let's activate the Render Preview. Let's start by getting rid of the background and have it be transparent. So to do this, we go to the Render Settings and under Film, check Transparent. I want to render the vest and the wings on separate layers, so let's disable the wings for now. Now I want the mannequin to be hidden from the render but still cast shadows onto the vest and bounce indirect light. To set this up, we first go to the Outliner Filter options and enable these toggles. The first one is the Holdout toggle, which we will be using later. The second one is the Indirect only. So now we can set the mannequin collection to be Indirect only by clicking on the toggle. As you can see, the mannequin is now hidden from the render, but is still casting shadows and bouncing indirect light. Pay attention to this part of the vest. I will turn the mannequin collection on and off. Without it, it is light and it has no color. With the mannequin set to indirect, it is darker and it has the bounce light color from the skin which is critical for a believable integration. Now if we pay attention to our reference, we see that our model is wearing a black shirt. So while we do want some of the skin color to be bouncing from here, as in the real world, it would have happened as well, we do not want the skin color to be bouncing from here, as in the real world, it would have been over his black shirt, so no color would be bouncing. To fix this, we will paint a black shirt onto the mannequin. My shader setup for the mannequin is a basic BSDF shader. If we want to paint on the mannequin, we first need a texture to paint on. So let's create one by pressing Shift A and searching for Image. Now let's click New to create a new texture. I will rename it Mannequin and set the resolution to 2K. For the color, I will place the mouse over the color of the base shader and press Ctrl C to copy. Now place the mouse over the color of the new texture and press Ctrl V to pass. Now let's click OK to create the new texture. Let's connect the color output to the base color of the shader. And since we copied the shader, there is no difference. Now before we start painting, let's get rid of the arms which are getting in the way. An easy way to do this is to select the model, go to the modifiers tab and disable the armature. Now let's switch to the texture paint mode. The UVs are already nicely laid out, so we do not need to worry about them. Let's pick a black color, adjust the brush size by using the F key and start painting. Once we are done painting, we can enable the modifier again and let's not forget to save the painted texture. 
Alright, so now our Mankin Indirect setup is complete. So I will rename the collection to Mankin Indirect. Now if we render the vest as is, this is what we get. We are getting the inside and the backside of the vest, which we do not want. Now of course we could create a mask and paint them out. But instead let's take advantage of the holdout function in Blender. So let's select the Mankin Indirect Collection, right click and choose Duplicate Collection. Now let's set this collection as a holdout by clicking on the holdout toggle. We are now punching a hole through the image based on the geometry of the holdout. I will rename it to Mankin Holdout. Because of the arms, we are also cutting the front part of the vest. And I do not want this as the 3D mannequin geometry does not match our real life model perfectly. So to avoid this, I will make the mannequin indirect not selectable and select the holdout mannequin. Now press tab to switch to edit mode and enable X-ray to select the geometry through the mesh. Now we'll select the forearms and delete them. And press tab to switch back to object mode. So now we are only cutting away the parts that we do not need and our vest render is finally set up. Now we need the 3D vest to cast a shadow onto the real life model. So we need our 3D mannequin to be invisible except for the shadows it receives. To do this, we use a shadow catcher. So let's disable the holdout and indirect collection and duplicate the mannequin indirect collection again. I will rename it to mannequin shadow catcher and make it selectable. Now let's select the mannequin and go to the object properties. Under the visibility tab, let's enable shadow catcher. Now for the shadow pass, we want the vest to be invisible, but still cast shadows onto our shadow catcher. So you guessed it, we set the vest collection to indirect only. And our shadow pass is complete. In Blender 3.0, we get a new and improved shadow catcher that supports indirect and environment lights. It also gets its own render pass. So here we are in Blender 3.0 Alpha. And to set it up, let's go to the View Layer Properties and enable Shadow Catcher. Now let's render the image. Now that the image is rendered, let's switch to the Compositing tab and connect the Shadow Catcher output to the image input of the Composite node. As you can see, the new Shadow Catcher now includes colors. Before saving the image, we must pay attention to something important. I am currently using the Filmic View Transform, which gives me a nice dynamic range in my renders. However, I do not want to apply this transform to the Shadow Catcher Pass, as this will give me incorrect results when compositing in Photoshop. So before saving the image, I can either turn it off, which gives me the correct Shadow Pass, or I can leave it on, and when going to Image, Save As, uncheck Save As Render. For the Wings Render, we set the mannequin and the vest to Indirect only. And to get the multiple renders out of Blender, I kept it simple and saved them one after the other with the Image Save As command. I choose the TIFF RGB Alpha format in 16-bit to have a high quality output for the grading in Photoshop. All right, so let's review our different elements. We got the wings, the shadows from the vest, which I partially repainted in Photoshop to have them look exactly how I wanted. The vest, which I masked in Photoshop to have the arms of the model come in front, a small piece of the beard of the model, 
which I also masked in Photoshop, to place on top of the vest. And finally, some background glow. When using the 3.0 version of the Shadow Catcher, set the blend mode of the layer to multiply. When opening renders in Photoshop, it is very useful to convert them to smart objects. This allows us to apply filters to the layer non-destructively. So let's select the wings layer, right click and choose convert to smart object. A very useful filter is the camera row filter. So with the smart object selected, I will go to filter, camera row filter. Here we can, for example, increase the clarity and the texture to make it pop. I can also make it warm. Now when I press OK, the settings are applied to the layer, but in a non-destructive way. So if I come back later and want to change the settings, I can double click on the camera row filter and make it blue for example. The nice thing about this workflow is that if I create a new render in Blender, for example the wings without the swords, I can convert this new render to a smart object and then click and drag the camera row filter onto the new render. And my previous settings are now applied to the new render. And finally, even though I knew from early on that I was going to go for this billboard format and this framing, I still rendered the 3D objects in their entirety to leave some flexibility for different formats adaptations. So this is how I created this movie poster. Let us know in the comments if you would have approached some things differently. Big thank you to all of the Sketchfab artists that shared their fantastic 3D models. You will find the credits and links in the video description. I hope you picked up some useful tips. I am Karim Joseph for Blended Daily. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.